Yeah, aliens are everywhere. In this room, and very likely at any other place on this planet, you, we are all surrounded by aliens. This might sound like a very bold and strong statement, but I hope that after my talk, I could convince you that this is very close to the truth, to the reality of our lives. But before I start to tell you the story about aliens, I want you asking two questions. I want you not thinking too much about it, just raise your hand if you agree or not. Who of you, who in this room, thinks the scene behind me is a very typical scene of the Western US? Please raise your hand. Is that a very typical scene? Yes, thanks. And who of you thinks this is a very typical German scene? A beer garden, come on. Yes, try to remember how you voted. I come to, uh, back to that a bit later. Okay, but what are the aliens I'm talking about? These are all the species here behind me and also those species I collected a couple of minutes in front of the Werk 2 here. Less the species painted by my daughter, but all the others. Animals, plants, in the soil, in the water, microorganisms, everywhere. Aliens could be any species you could think about. But what is an alien in specific? You see here the distribution map of the North American raccoon, one of my beloved animals. In red is the distribution, so it's the range of the species where it occurs by nature. So the raccoon occurs by nature in Central and North America. And in blue, you see the distribution of the North American raccoon, which is not by nature, but due to human assistance. So always when I talk about aliens in the talk, I mean I speak about species at a certain place where they are not occurring by nature, but due to our assistance, okay? Let me tell you a story about the raccoon. This is uh, the National Park of Edersee. It's a very beautiful national park in the center of Germany. I was hiking there last year. Very nice. Let's go back to the 30s of the last century. 1934, there were two very smart hunters, and they thought to enrich the German fauna. They wanted to introduce a species that could hunt and could do some nice hats out of it, like this one. Fur was a very big thing in fashion back in the 30s of the last century. So they wanted to release two raccoons. They bought them from a nearby fur farm, a pregnant female and a male raccoon. But Germany wouldn't be Germany if you would not have to ask thousands of people fill in forms and forms, even back in the 30s. And what they had to do to ask people who know about that. And they asked this guy here, Karl Hagenbeck, who was back in this time the director of the very famous Hagenbeck Zoo in Hamburg. And he knew a lot about wildlife, and he had, by strange coincidence, a couple of raccoons back in his backyard held in captivity. So he had the raccoon in the cage, and he knew always when the raccoon came out, he was a very good hunter. He always found some small dead animals in the cage. So Karl Hagenbeck was very skeptical about He knew, okay, this seems to be a good hunter. I have no idea what the, happens with the raccoons in the Edersee. I, I wouldn't do that. But think about it, it was 1934, no WhatsApp, no email, the letter took a while. And so the letter arrived so late that the impatient hunters released the raccoons. They released them, there was a pregnant female, they just wanted to get rid of it. And this small event actually led to a very big effect on the ecosystems in Europe. It had a very big legacy. What you see here behind me is a map of Europe and the dynamic spread of the North American raccoon across Europe. You see the names of the countries and the years when the first time, for the first time, the raccoon was recorded in those countries. So the raccoon made it across many European countries. The two animals released there and a couple of similar, few similar events led to a population which we estimate up to 1.4 million individuals in Germany. The raccoon is now occurring everywhere in Germany with a population size of 1.4 million individuals and that's just Germany. I showed you that the raccoon also occurs in many other countries. A small event and big effects. But how does all the other species transported across the planet? Are there more? Yes, there are more. What you see here is the transportation network of our planet. So you see the cities, you see the roads, you see the shipping routes, and you see the airplane network. And all those networks are the routes where we move every day 
billions of tons of goods across this planet. And not only we trade across those networks, we also move ourselves. We travel to the most remote islands, to the highest mountains, largest cities. And with those goods, with us, alien species travel, travel across the planet to any other place. How is that linked? I will tell you a couple of examples. This is the Chinese mitten crab, Chinesische Wollhandkrabbe, you might heard of it. And as the name already says, it's an Asian species which now occurs in many European coastal areas and rivers. And how that, does this happen? The Chinese mitten crab traveled with ballast water. Ballast water is the water ships take up if they are not stable enough because they have too little load. So that the ships take up with big pumps in front of harbors a lot of water to stabilize themselves and release this water in the destination harbor. And that happened with the Chinese mitten crab. It was taken up somewhere in Korea probably and then released in the water near Hamburg. In this water there are many, many species transported. Small larvae, eggs, small species of fishes, crabs, mussels, jellyfishes, what you can think about. Ballast water is one of the most important pathways for the transportation of marine alien species. And there are many more. This is the Botanical Garden in Kew. Botanical gardens are inherently a place where we grow species from different places. And in many botanical gardens, there are species or the seeds or the parts of those plants which made it over the fence. Heraclium mantigazianum, the giant hogweed, Riesenbeerenklau, was first time seen beyond the fence of Kew Botanical Garden. It is now one of the most widespread alien invader in Europe. Wooden pellets. There are many insects living in wooden pellets. And after they are transported across the planet, they crawl out of the wood and spread across the countries. Similar this seed ball here we feed our birds with. There are seeds in there, and from those seeds, plants are growing. And one of the very widespread alien species in Germany, the Ambrosia, common ragweed, which can create a lot of allergic reaction, was transported via those seed balls. But it's not only that those species hitchhiking on the goods we transport, they're also hitchhiking on ourselves. My shoes when I'm going hiking looking always like this. And so we also transport seeds, plant material, even animals on our bodies. 35,000 tourists in Antarctica poses nowadays the greatest threat to that ecosystem because they transport new species to Antarctica. So I could hopefully show you that those species transported across the global network. One example is again the common ragweed, the ambrosia, the one with the allergic reactions. It's actually North American originating, but now it occurs in over 150 regions across this planet, thanks to us. Aliens are everywhere, but are they really everywhere? Coming back to the questions I had, you see this nice scene here. And what you can see here, this rolling bush, is actually a Russian species. The tumbleweed is a Russian species which was brought by settlers in the 19th century to the US. But it's so long there that it's already part of the culture. It's part of the heritage, part of movies. And the same with the beer garden. It's, yes, it's a very typical German beer garden, but the tree you see here, the horse chestnut, Ross Castagna, is actually originating in the Balkan region. And it was introduced to Germany because it grows nicely, gives a lots of shade, cool tree for beer gardens. What I want to say is that alien species are partly so long here in those regions that they're even part of our heritage, of our culture. But why do I tell you this story? Not because I like to be here, oh, it's, it's a nice event, but uh, because researchers think a lot about those introductions. They think about what is the impact of those introductions. Are those species bad or good aliens? Do they have impacts? Do they have negative or positive impacts? And that is where research comes into play, people like me and my colleagues at IDEF, the center I work for. And I will give a few examples how, uh, what kind of impact species could have. You see here two spots. Uh, the pictures are taken a few hundred meters apart from each other in the northwestern US by a good colleague of mine in the same time of the year. One place you see lots of plants under the trees, one place there are no plants under the trees. And the difference is the occurrence of earthworms. In this part of the US, earthworms are not native. There are no earthworms there. 
And the way how earthworms live in the soil can lead to very dramatic effects for the ecosystems. In this case, the, the way how earthworms live in the soil led to the loss of the plant species, and you can imagine not only the plant species, but also many other species depending on those. The whole ecosystem changed due to alien earthworms. Another example is the house cat. The house cat, free-ranging house cat, is probably the most harmful alien species on this planet. Every year, house cats kill billions, milliarden, billions of individuals, of species of, on this planet. Several extinctions are already happened, happened already due to house cats. It's a very, very negative impact of an alien species. If an alien species has a very negative impact, we call it invasive. And then people came up, okay, this seems to be a big problem. What politicians always ask, how much is it? So how much does, do alien species cost? And they come, came up with a number, which is this one. I think I beat today every number we heard today. This is one trillion. People, researchers, estimated the global economic losses due to alien species up to one trillion euro per year. And that doesn't count any extinct species. How could you monetize a species which is lost to the planet? One trillion. What does this number include? So the people had numbers, few values from six large economies, and they found that up to 180 billion euro per year are alien species damaging to crop harvests. Alien species damaging crop harvests, and this is the loss of it. And also the rat a very alien, a very invasive species, costs up to almost 50 billion euro across this planet. And among this one trillion euro, there are also lots of health costs. As I told you, for example, the ambrosia creates lots of health problems that also costs money. But just to be clear, for the majority of alien species, we have no idea what the impact is. Research on the impact of species somewhere is a very hard thing and not easy to do. There is a minority which costs a lot of money, which is harmful, but there is also a small minor minority which could be positive. Like those species here, they offer food for birds or for butterflies. But about how many alien species do we actually talk about? How many do we have on the planet? It's a very good question, which is not easy to answer, even if researchers always like to count. But what we know from research I was also involved about plants is that there are places on this planet which have more alien plants than native. You find, for example, on Madeira, a very beautiful island in Europe, more alien plants in the wild than native ones. And the same is true, for example, for Tahiti also a very beautiful place. More alien plants on those islands than natives, thanks to human assistance. But to bring you a bit more into perspective in terms of numbers, we should start about the general number of alien species. Researchers know that we more or less know about 1.6 million species on this planet. Researchers have described 1.6 million species on this planet. And we know from different global assessments that we have roughly 16,000 species of aliens on this planet. But this is a big underestimation because it doesn't include insects, the largest group of species. But what we also know is that we at the moment only know about 10 to 20 percent of biodiversity already. There's much, much more we have no idea, not described yet, we don't know yet. And taking this into account, also means that we probably have way, way more aliens floating, living around, surrounding us, we don't know about, not described yet, and they are non, not known to research. And this number is actually much more worrisome because the 10 million and the 1.6 million very badly include microorganisms. It is a species group we know very little about and just start to know about the biodiversity of microorganisms. I give you a small example. This shoe here could be easily the shoe of my son. I expect my son will have the next month always, every day, shoes like this. And on this handful of dirt, like on this shoe, we can kind of found up to 10,000 different species, algae, fungi, microorganisms, on each of those shoes. Think about that. Every one of us has those shoes, transport dirt on her or his shoe. 
What is done about that? I told you about that there are many aliens that cost a lot of money. There's a lot of management measures done. People know since decades about alien species. We chemically and physically treat ballast water. We treat the wooden pallets. There are many plants not anymore allowed to be sold in garden markets and so on. But it's not enough. The planet is way too big. There are way too many borders to be controlled. Countries are just very, very large, and many countries don't have enough money to uh, manage that. Uh, every one of us can also do something. Think about the shoes. You can clean your shoes before you travel, before you come back. You can also think about which plants you grow in your garden. Maybe those which are known to be harmful shouldn't be planted. Every one of us can do a lot of small steps to help. The way how we change biodiversity every day has very dramatic effects on our ecosystem of the planet. Species go extinct every day, and species are traveled around, aliens, thanks to human assistance. And it, this is like putting the whole globe, the biosphere of the planet, into a big mixer. It leads to the global biohomogenization. It is actually like biotic McDonaldization. Yeah? Formerly distinct places you, uh, lose their uniqueness. And we have now the knowledge from the past to use and to manage the future. We can use this expertise of scientists, of researchers, of conservationists, of you, to come up with a plan what we should move and how we should move across the planet. We should wisely use the expertise and the knowledge from the past now to manage the future. It's the future of our planet. Thanks.